power. It's not by accident. You have to work for it. Good day viewers, you're welcome to another edition of The Platform. I am Antonia Oshini. Now for those of you just tuning in for the first time, it's great to have you join us. And uh, The Platform is a program where we talk about matters relating to the government of Nigeria, we look at the state of Nigeria as a whole, and we focus on matters that affect Nigerians particularly. So on today's program, we're going to be analyzing the state of insecurity in Nigeria as we analyze how the president is tackling this issue. We're going to be breaking down the several factors that are affecting the security state in Nigeria. And we're going to look at how better to approach this matter because we know that there have been a lot of issues bordering uh, insecurity and we have made several complaints to the government, but you know it seems to be falling on deaf ears. Anyways, with me in the studio is a guest who will be rubbing minds with me as we talk about this matter. Don't go anywhere. The show continues after this break. Welcome back to the show. This is still the platform for those of you just tuning in. Now, my guest on the show today is a political analyst and a political science lecturer at Christopher University, Mr. Kayode Obashoro. Sir, good afternoon. It's nice to have you on the show. Good afternoon. Thank you, Tonya. Thank you for inviting me. All right, sir. So we're going to be looking at uh, the state of insecurity in Nigeria. Now, we all know for a fact that uh, there has been a rampant case of kidnappings in Nigeria with particular concentration on the northeastern part. Now, we know that uh, our president is from that region and there have been several uh, comments that he's not doing the right thing because those are like his people. What do you think about this, with it having, happening so much in uh, the northeastern states? Thank you. Um, the question of insecurity in Nigeria is not limited to the northeast. We need to put that in proper perspective. Okay. Indeed, in the very recent past, it has been in the northwest oh, yeah. and not central. Okay. So we need to put it in proper perspective. And also, the secondary comment I will make on this issue, when you focus on issue of security on an individual, then you will not be getting it right. The truth is, he heads the administration, and it is easy for us to interpret that he's not doing enough, because perhaps these people belong to his ethnic group. Okay, yeah. But the truth is the victims also also belong to his ethnic group. So we need to mm. put it in proper perspective as one of a failure of governance in this particular issue. Because at the end of the day, governance is all about improving the well-being of the people. If your question is an assessment of how this government, of course with the president as the leader, have handled the issue of insecurity, I will say clearly that this government has failed woefully. Mm. Especially if we go back history that this government, this government came into being on the promise of ending insecurity in Nigeria. Mm. In that aspect, this government has not done well at all. Well, you see now that it seems like these kidnappings and banditry and the whole activities of the headsmen, they seem to be, they seem to be rewarded whenever they are met and then they, are, they, they have dialogues with these people that they meet with from the government and then, you know, they are beginning to see it as a, a sort of lucrative activity. Now, do you think it is proper to be rewarding them, giving them money or whatever form of rewards? Do you think it is proper for the government to be making a kind of dialogue or whatever with these bandits? To be clear, we need to, again, put these things in proper perspective because we are talking about different governments. Yeah. I don't think the federal government 
has a policy of negotiating with bandits or kidnappers. I don't think, but we know that there are several state governments that have done it as a policy. So it's still part of the failure of governance I'm talking about. Certainly, it is not proper in government yeah. or governance to negotiate with criminals. It is not. For me, my perspective is all this is like a business and political um, decision. So you have governors negotiating with bandits, in fact, in front of camera, armed bandits, offering monies to them. And what it just does, it just encourages other groups, other fringe groups to join, because this, as it were, in my own opinion, is strictly a business decision. And don't rule out the possibility that many people in government benefit from these policies. Yeah, it appears to, it, it appears that this, this, uh, these bandits have an inner man in S government. Certainly. Yeah, and uh, this Islamic um, cleric, Sheikh Ahmad Gumi, yes. he has mentioned that uh, these bandits, uh, we are to see them as peaceful people, they are just victims of circumstance. And uh, he feels like we should keep on dialoguing with them because that they are just trying to say that the government didn't provide for them. So they are trying to find a means to fend for themselves and their families. But then they are still harming these people that they, they claim to be members of their society and their, and their family. Now this cleric now, do you think it is proper for him to say that people that are attacking innocent civilians are peaceful people? What point is he trying to make there? If you ask me again, I will say that Gumi has no point he's making. The truth is, you see, we have the tendency of being sentimental in our decision. Of course, Gumi is a full and a person. Yeah. And it has been shown that most of these criminal elements we are talking about are full and a people. So he's just talking from the perspective of his ethnic background. But how do we situate the government that allows this kind of a person to go around passing this kind of information? I think he's not doing service to this government, and the government not taking action against him is not doing service to itself. Because I imagine if every person from all the geopolitical group makes this kind of conclusion, and recommendation. Yeah. Where will we find ourselves in terms of security in this country? So I think Gumi is somebody that should be reined in because if you ask me, it's beginning to sound and look like an accomplice to these criminal elements. Well, I, I find it funny that this cleric, Gumi, was able to be taken into the forest to meet these bandits and they negotiated and they talked and the government is aware that, okay, even if, let's say, they, when they were taking him there, they probably covered his face for him to not know their location or whatever, but isn't there a way the government, because looking at other governments of other countries, like the United States, for example, there is no way they will not use some form of, okay, let's say Nigeria is technologically still backward, <laughs> but there, there should have been a way for them to, like, track that location and just pinpoint their spot and just deal with them, because for you to be able to meet with them face to face, you are in their camp. Majority of their leaders are there, so you can get a handful of them and then sanction them properly. But these things keep happening over and over again, and is it begs the question that are you sure the government doesn't have a big hand in this? Because if Gumi can go and meet them, you know, and no harm is done to him, they okay. Presume, presume, presumably they said they are they are peacemakers. Okay, they peacefully negotiated with him or whatever. Isn't there a way the government can find it? Because we know that uh, Sambisa Forest is where most of the Chibo girls were taken, or most of these bandits are there, but nothing has been done to catch them or to deal with them. So don't you think there's a form of um, means the government could employ to pinpoint these bandits? Thank you for that question. Um, we must make it clear that the main purpose of government is to provide security for life and property of its citizens. Yes. That is very clear. 
So a government that fails to do that as its primary duty, in my own opinion, has failed hopefully. Now I hate to join the group that accuses the government of hurting itself because that is what it is when a government does not respond appropriately. But the fact is, I believe clearly under this dispensation we have a problem of the political will to do what is proper to end this scourge. You talked about Gumi knowing where these people are. Yeah. And it, it is very disheartening because I listened to the National Security Advisor that said the, practice, the government actually asked Gumi to carry out this activity. Wow. So that tells you wow. the problem we are facing as a people at this particular time. Mm -hmm. So the issue of political will, if you ask me, is the because the government has spent so much at least they have told us they have spent so much. So I think it's just a clear case of the lack of political will. So it's not impossible that government is not doing what it's supposed to do for political reasons. And I think that's what we need to interrogate. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Well, we'll be going on a quick break now. Don't go anywhere. The show continues right after this. Welcome back to the program. This is still the platform, and my guest has been explaining the state of insecurity in Nigeria. Now, Mr. Kayode, is it possible to say that uh, Nigerian schools can ever dream of a safe schooling condition with reference to boarding schools? Because they seem to be the, the target of these kidnappers. And, uh, you know, sometimes we, we, we were assuming that it was mostly the female gender that was being kidnapped for some particular reason. But now, I think th that was in uh, Zamfara State, where schoolboys were kidnapped now and they, they've been released, I think after some form of ransom was paid. So do you think there's ever going to be a state where, you know, boarding school students feel like, oh, we're protected, our government has our backs, we're going to be safe? Because schooling in Nigeria, as a border, you are constantly living on the on the edge because you don't know which 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 uh, which sex will just come and invade your school and just carry a number of you. So, do you feel like there's ever going to be a safe schooling condition in Nigeria? I hope that will, that there will be in future. Mm. But if we have to be honest with ourselves, is there security anywhere? For, forget the boarding schools. Because they use children a lot, like they, they just play it. on... So, the issue of security, yes, we can deliberately talk about boarding schools. What about other places? Like I said, I hope that sometime in the future, yeah. we will be able to say this confidently. But my fears are that the government does not have the political will to address the issue of insecurity in this country. And that is my own personal opinion. It is okay. when that will is put in practice. Yeah. Because like they say, the boarding houses, the boarding schools, these are just soft targets. So it is, those are places that ordinarily criminal elements will easily attack. And for it to happen, two, three, four, you talked about uh, Katsina, it's happened in Zamfara, it's happened in Kaduna, it's happened in Niger oh, State. No, Indeed, it happened a few days ago in Ogun State here, where some students wow. of uh, Olabijo Olab okay, okay, were yeah. kidnapped right in front of their hostel. So it's, 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 it's something that is far-fetched, but like I said, I hope that in future, but all this depends on the actions and the inactions of government. And please, when we talk about government, yeah. let's not restrict ourselves to the federal. Of course, we know that the federal controls the security yeah. apparatus, of course. But even the states must be part of this venture. Yeah. Now, looking at the state of Nigerian politics, come 2023 elections, do you think 
there's a possibility of a youth winning the presidential election. Because if you look at it now, uh, the, current, the latest uh, appointed EFCC chairman is, uh, is, below, is below 50 years and is one of the youngest in, that has ever been in that position. And looking at it now, everybody is trying to see, okay, what is he going to achieve? What does he have? in line, what are his plans for EFCC and all. So if we are able to, by luck, <laughs> by luck, get a, a youth to take up the mantle of being the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, do you think there will be an instant positive change at all? Well, first and foremost, who is a youth? Perhaps if we define that. But I've always believed that the position of the president of this country is not something that should be determined by age, by tribe, by religion. I think it is the person. You talked about the youth, and the question I asked, who is the youth? For your information, the youth leaders of the two major political parties are not less than 65 years old. Youth leaders? Yes. They, 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 youth leaders of the two major political parties in this country to the, the national youth leaders are not less than 65 years old. So, but I believe that with time, we will start looking at it. But to me, it has nothing. Success at being the president or governor, to me, has nothing to do with age. That's my own personal yeah. opinion. We must start looking at the individuals. What, what experience do they have? What we have found out in our country is that we have people running for the highest positions of office without anything concrete they have done, either in their professions yeah. or in their associations. Many of them just have happened to be in government. Many of them have been in military government. So that is what we should be focusing on, more on, not on the age because we've seen older people do better in other climbs we've seen much younger people do much better in other climbs so what's our own problem most of the leaders that we have today were people that became national leaders at the age of 30. Mm. the obasanjos yeah. the buharis the Gowans. They became heads of state below the ages of 40. So, for me, it's not a matter of age. It's more of the matter of the person. Now, looking at this now, if you say, uh, the, if you, your own take is that um, it's not a matter of age or tribe or religion for we to have a good leader as a president, do you think that... Um, we need new political parties or the people in those parties should be changed because we have we know that uh, over the past four or eight years the the parties that have been having their candidates win the presidential elections are basically apc or the pdp yes so now do you think that this is just that we come like a status quo now we can't have any other party win and there, there were some claims of um, new parties being created, new political parties being created. So is that a solution, creating new political parties, or is it the people themselves, the candidates that we need to, you know, sieve out from these, these parties that are like the top ones? I, I think it's more of seeking out people that are willing and able to do this job. Because for your information, Today in Nigeria, we have over 116 registered political parties. Over 116. And I'm sure there are some scores of others that are waiting to be registered. So it's not a matter of political At least for the case of Nigeria, I don't think it's a matter of political parties. But you see, you have a situation, an unfortunate situation in Nigeria, that we don't have political parties that have any kind of ideology. Yeah. The ideology of most politicians in Nigeria is to just get to power. So even today, if we want to be honest, we have an APC government. 
80% of the top people, in fact, if you ask me, almost all the governors, the members of the Senate, yeah. were members of the APC or PDP at one time or the other. So you, what you find is when they lose out here, they jump to this. Just like Winga Daniel that has migrated now. It's it. just the former speaker of the House of Reps. Yakubu Dagogara, as a sitting speaker, decamped to another party. One re-election and decamped back to the party from which he... Mm -hmm. so, so it's not a matter of political parties. It is a matter of people. And significantly, I think somehow, our electorate has been an accomplice in all these problems. Exactly. Problems. I was getting to that question now. What I wanted to say is like, on that matter now, is it proper for us to just have, okay, uh, once, mm -hmm. you are, once you are up to the voting age, yes. you can go and cast your vote during elections. Don't you feel like we need to have like uh, a particular, a particular segregation, not segregation per se, but just saying like those that are literate in this particular field, you need to be aware of certain things, there should be some qualification before you just go and vote. Because the the layman on on the street that is just, that is just going about his daily activities, I don't know much about what it entails to hand over your votes to this particular candidate. He just goes to vote on count that okay, I'm trying to contribute to my country. So I feel like any 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 uh, any member of the electorate going to vote should have some level of qualifications. Let's say, I don't know if there are some countries where you must have, let's say you must be, you must own a property that you show that you are learned enough or you are into, you are, you, are, you are knowledgeable about some things relating to politics or just have some level of education about politics before you just go and vote. Not that you just get to the age and then you are qualified to vote. Well, um, yes, as noble as your opinion is, you are going back history because there was a time that suffrage was limited. Suffrage, yeah. You know, to qualify to vote, you needed to be a property owner and all that. But societies have evolved. Now we talk about universal adult suffrage. Yeah. So we cannot certainly go back to a lot of people of the right to vote. All over the world today, what we are saying is that everyone that is entitled to vote should be able should to vote. vote yeah. The question the electoral, electorate have to find out who is that person I want to vote for. What are those factors that motivate me voting for? Is it because he's from my tribe? He's from my religion? Mm. You know, those are the things that we must look at. Then most importantly, what is the role of political parties? They are supposed to educate the electorate. Yeah. But that is, they can only educate when they also have things they want to educate us about. Like I said, the typical Nigerian politician has no ideology. The typical Nigerian politician, I repeat, has no ideology. The only ideology they work with is getting power. That's all. So if it means decamping and recamping and decamping, they will continue to do that for as long as they get elected into offices. But like I said, the electorate has to start and let's be honest with ourselves, getting to power is not by accident. You have to work for it. Yeah. So if while we blame the current politicians, the burden politicians, the new ones, should work and be willing to sacrifice to get to positions of authority. Well, sometimes it's not always the, on the on count of working hard. Some people are there based on connection. <laughs> so when you... I like that point. So people that know that they have people there and they can get there if they want, they wish, you know, they just need to make a phone call and make a request and <coughs> just snap with your finger you are there. That will continue to be the case. But you see, the people that make those complaints also, if they had the benefit of enjoying the support of those connections, they will exactly. take advantage of it. <laughs> so somebody, like I said, power is not given to anybody on a platter. Mm -hmm. You have to work for it. And you must be willing to sacrifice. You must be willing to bid your time. There's nothing wrong in contesting and losing. There's nothing wrong, absolutely.
Well, I feel like with all the uh, kidnappings and every other insecurity issue in Nigeria, my not honest opinion, I feel like uh, if an insurgency should last for more than 24 hours, yes. it's clear to say that the government has a hand in it because there is no way that something like as serious as an insurgency is on in a country with leaders and nothing is done. A day goes, two days, three days. Look at the Chibok girls that were still counting years and mm -hmm. some people have forgotten about it. Some parents have just gotten over the issue and just moved on and it's just like, it's just a pathetic state of the country because the, the government don't, they don't really relate because most of their relatives or children are not residing in Nigeria. So there yeah, are little or few, little or no uh, affection to them. They are not really, really affected by these issues, and it's just sad because it, it, it remains the case of the rich keeps getting richer and the poor keep getting poor, and they just complaints, piling over complaints, and nothing is being done for it. Well, I hope Nigeria will someday arrive at the the state of utopia that we all dream of. <laughs> like they say, a people deserve the government or leadership they get. If after 60 years yeah. we still have this crop of leaders all through the military, now civilian dispensation, and we still vote for them, then the problem is not with our stars, the problem is with us as a people. I believe that we have enough of these failed leaders to say at least this once we won't vote for them. We can try other ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we have gotten to that point now in our history. For as long as we, the electorate, continue to tolerate this, then this is what will be offered to us. Well, we've come to the end of today's edition of the platform. Thank you so much, sir, for coming to the program. I appreciate your presence here. Thank you so much. I hope next time we meet your presence, you would you know, grace us with your appearance. Thank you for having me. Certainly, I will be willing to be here. All right, thank sir. You. Okay. And to our viewers, thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget, you can watch our previous episodes on our YouTube channel at Unicris Amcos. Of course, Amcos stands for Association of Mass Communication Students. You know, they are the crew behind the whole show. that package is everything as well as myself, too. All right, so we'll be leaving you now, but we'll be here again next week for another edition of the platform. Do well to protect yourself out there, keep your mask on, stay safe, use the sanitizers, and always adhere to rules of you know, social distancing. I am Antonia Oshley. Thanks for watching. Yeah.